Hi and welcome back. We are doing a book review on The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. Uh, you're again joined with myself, Trevor and Mark. We're going to be talking to you. And uh, today we're going to be looking at Purpose 3, which is you were created to become like Christ. As we're going to this topic, what are some of the key thoughts that you have about this week's devotion in the 40 day devotional? I think to be created into something, like the first thing I think of is like clay. You know, I know this is a typical Christian, you know, part of clay, but it really is. It's like, you know, you have this mound of clay which looks formless, and yet the potter creates something out of it. And, and I think like it's, it's, the, it's the potter that has the blueprint in his mind. The potter is the one who knows what he wants to achieve, it's not the clay. And I think in all of this, it, it speaks this week speaks into something of saying, well, what does the end result look like? It looks like Christ, mm -hmm. surely it does. Like if you read out through the New Testament, it's like actually how do we become like Christ formed into a being that looks like Christ, we live like Christ. But it's gonna require a total devotion and surrendering of heart, mind, soul, I would say every aspect of our lives yeah. to allow the potter total reign and authority over our lives to shape us into something of what we ultimately desire to be. And I think that's the whole thing. I think there's this joy in us, there's this excitement in us to become like Jesus. I'd say that if you ask every Christian believer, mm. would you wanna be like Jesus? They would all say, yes. Pick me coach. Yeah, pick me, I'm that guy, put me in the front of the queue. They would all want that, we would all want that. But then if you had to sort of play out what that's going to require of you yeah. and what's going to take place to shape and mold you into something of being like Christ, I think that's a challenge. I know for me, it's like, we want to be like Jesus and, and, and uh, I've used this before and it's hard, it's hard on even for myself, but we say, okay, you want to be like Jesus, that's great. Uh, are you prepared to forgive like Jesus? Yeah. And if that's the case, if you want to learn how to forgive like Jesus, well, when do you have to exercise forgiveness, Trev? Yeah. It's when you need to forgive someone. Someone has betrayed you. Someone has done, inflicted something upon you which is horrible, but yet it requires you to forgive. Yeah. I, I remember when, when we were in Nashville together, not sure if you remember that, that leaders um, conference that Belonging Co were doing, and um, Henry Seeley was talking about when Jesus was at the Last Supper, until the very last moment, he gave Judas the opportunity to repent. Crazy. He didn't expose his rebellion. He didn't say he's the guy that's gonna betray me. And I think in that moment, you just see a different level of character yeah. where, where Jesus was, like you're saying, giving Judas, even until that last moment, the opportunity to repent. Mm -hmm. And even when he walked out, Jesus knowing he was going to go and plot his eventual murder, Jesus still didn't expose him. Crazy. Um, which is exactly what you're saying. W one of the things which I loved, a quote that Rick Warren had there, is he said, every time you forget that character is one of God's purposes for your life, you will become frustrated with your circumstances. <laughs> and I love that. It's just like so often we become frustrated with our circumstances. We actually, God is like, no, I'm far more concerned with your character than your comfort. And so I'm gonna use this circumstance to make you uncomfortable and to see what actually comes out. So often in our lives, our seasons, it's one of those like, God, teach me what I need to learn because I can't carry on doing this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and often that's the case. It's like, I, I think of even when I grew up, I found myself going into to a business environment and as beneficial as it was for me at, in the long run, at the time, I was not enjoying it at all. I was asking the question like, God, how much longer? You know, I know, that, I know all the scripture, and jo you know, it's stuff to throw at myself, like, you know, God is working on your character and he's putting, I know all that stuff, yeah. but it's horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's horrible, you know? But it's that whole thing of going, okay, uh, like God, teach me what I need to learn so that I can keep moving forward into what you've called me to. I think, yeah, again, I think um, at 2 Corinthians, I love just the scriptures that have been used even throughout this whole entire book, but it says, as the spirit of the Lord works within us, mm. 
Not from a distance. Yeah. He's not throwing darts at us. He's not trying to hit us with a sword. He's working within us. There's an intimacy about that. Yeah. There's a closeness about it. It's, it's, it's a powerful picture of going, the, the one that will help us, the one that will shape us, the one that will mold us is not coming once a month mm. to inspect. He is constantly in us day in and day out, every second of each day, which gives me confidence. It says, we become more and more like him and reflect his glory even more. Why? Because it's not up to me. Yes, it is on my surrendering, but actually I've recognized the work of the Holy Spirit Mm. that is actively doing something in the unseen parts of my life. Yeah. Uh, One of the things I love about this book is how practical Rick Warren gets. And one of the things that he talks about as our responsibility to be transformed into becoming like Christ Mm. is he says there, there are three key responsibilities that we have. Firstly, we've got to choose to let go of our old ways. Secondly, we need to change the way we think. And then thirdly, we must put on the character of Christ by developing new godly habits. Mm. And, and I love that. So it's like, stop what you used to do. Um, your old life shouldn't look like your Christian life. Secondly, change the way you think, which is the age old, you know, Romans 12 text of renewing your mind and not conforming to the pattern of this world. But then what I love is he's got to put on your new self, but that new self is actually developing new godly habits. And I think as Christians, we sometimes fall short of the new godly habits. It's like we know what we need to stop doing, the really bad things. We, we, We know we need to read the Bible and learn to renew our mind, but then we don't step fully into well, what does it look like to put on Christ-like habits? Mm. And uh, I think that really impacted me in, in this week's devotional. So let me just uh, go off a little bit of the beaten track here. I'm sure you've done this before, Trev, so don't say you don't, but um, growing up, trying to get a tan, you know what I mean, around the pool. I'm sure you did that, don't you? But... <laughs> no mental picture, no. <laughs> but it was like day after day, lying in the sun to get the perfect tan, you know what I mean? And I'm just saying, this was when I was very young, so I don't do that anymore, you know, but anyway. And uh, it took a while, it a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort sometimes, putting on creams, different stuff like that. Nowadays you can just go to buy it off the shelf Sorry, and spray I on it. I can't believe we actually go here. I'm just I, saying. I hope this is a great illustration. <laughs> it's a brilliant illustration. Okay, keep going. Because nowadays you can just go to some pharmacy or whatever and buy a spray on tan. There's an instantaneous sort of response of, this is what I want, I want it now, and I'm gonna get it now. I'm not gonna inconvenience myself to get it. And that's, in a sense, I love how Rick, he, he, he reminds us again, because often it's like, well, how long is this going to take? So I'm still struggling with the picture of you by the pool. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll okay. get clarity. But it's that whole thing of like, how long is this going to take? How long will maturity take? Like, I want it now. I want to go to the shelf. I want to pick it off the shelf and I want to get it so that I get it now. And Rick Warren says, becoming like Christ is a long, slow process mm. of growth. Spiritual maturity is neither instant nor automatic. It is a gradual, progressive development that will take the rest of your life. Mm. And, and, and he says, it, it's just in this place that if we continue, continue day in and day out, giving ourselves to this process, mm. that slowly but surely, and we probably don't even realize it, but maturity comes. Yeah. Maturity comes. Others might see it, but often we don't. And so in this world we live of instantaneous, like this is what I want, I want it now. If I order it today, it must arrive tomorrow. The Christian faith is not that faith. Yeah. The Christian outworking, and, and I think that's where people get tripped up, Trev. I think often it's like, I want God now. He needs to arrive now. I need to sort this thing out now. But to become like Christ mm-hmm. is a journey that... I believe if we're prepared to go on is the adventure of all the adventures. Yeah. Uh, I, one of the things which really struck me in, in the book that he says is when people are casual about their spiritual growth, it shows they don't understand the eternal implications. Sure. And I think a lot of people get saved into an environment where the goal is conversion yeah. The goal is not discipleship. Getting you over the line. Getting you over the line. So, so as long as you've given your life to Jesus, we're, we're good with that. But that was never what Jesus instructed. 
his instruction was always to disciple people, which means to learn to walk like your master. Mm. And I mean, I was shocked, just, you know, did a, a personal study on prayer and fasting a little while ago. And until probably about a century ago, like fasting twice a week was normal in every church context. Um, and it was just like it blew my mind that somewhere in the, the early church, prayer and fasting and the disciplines that, that Jesus used to evidence himself, drawing away into moments of solitude and mm-hmm. um, spending time with the Father, uh, that all seems almost like olden day now. And in the new modern era that we live in, those spiritual disciplines, which are, which are tough, um, you know, fasting is not a fun thing to do. I, I remember always, you know, coming from a background where, where I was like, no, that's legalistic and, you know, we're living under grace and we're living under freedom and actually looking and saying, no, the early church fathers were living under incredible grace and yet the early church, they would fast usually twice a week and it was just this devotion to God and it wasn't in the act of what they were doing, but it was this thing of, I'm going to empty myself of my own desires and my own flesh. And in so doing, I'm going to allow the Spirit to fill me with the Spirit's desires. And I think that's what we see in the life of Jesus over and over again. Mm. And to become someone, and this is an interesting one, because I think becoming like Christ, if we are born into sin, which we are, and He is right and holy, like if you even look at that, that that's a journey. It's a journey of of unlearning habits Mm. and learning new and devoting yourself to other things. As we started this whole uh, journey together in in this book, it's like we often give ourselves we often give ourselves to things and things that aren't have no eternal uh, value at all. And but but I love he does really get down to if I can say the nitty gritties of this whole thing, because ultimately how do we how, what shapes us and molds us? What is that which, which is the sandpaper on our lives to get us into that space? Well, ultimately, we are transformed by truth. Yeah. And so day 24, he hits that right on the head. And it is not an easy one because many of us, you know, mm. truth is whatever we want truth to be. That's yeah. the society we live in today. But yet actually when we look at Scripture and we are so grateful that we have this rudder, that helps direct us through the storm of the truth of the Word of God. It says, well, Mark, you, you know, you can believe anything you want to, but it's not truth. Yeah. This is what truth is. And so he hits it there and, and, he, and he says the transformation comes when it's not just hearing this truth, but it's allowing this truth to start to work in us yeah. and outwork itself through us. Yeah. I, I, I love a bit of good alliteration. You know me. Come tell us, and, uh, and, and I think he, he does that throughout this book, but he looks at three things. He says, first, we must accept the word of God as authority. Secondly, we need to assimilate its truth, which means we need to receive it, we need to read it, we need to reflect on it. But then he says, and then we need to apply its principles. So it's this thing of, do we really believe that the Bible is the ultimate authority? it is the truth, as you're saying, then are we actually massaging it into our lives? Are we assimilating it into our actual beliefs and how we view the world? Mm. Is it part of our worldview? And then how are we actually applying it? And and one of the quotes that I I love by Andy Stanley, he says, it's far better to do a little than to know a lot. Mm. And so often as Christians, we think that our role is to increase our knowledge where it's actually not to increase our knowledge, it's to change our lives. Mm. Like that's the role of the Bible. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful thing to, to come to terms with the fact that if we want to be like Jesus, as I said around the beginning, everyone would say, yeah, we want to be like Jesus. You know, are we doing what Jesus did? You know, mm. are we modeling something of what he did? And I think that is probably one of the biggest things of, of, of a Christian to walk out and go, well, what would Jesus do? I remember when I grew up, we'd have these little bangles that would say WWJD. Love those, did you love yeah. those? How many did you have? Like a whole bunch up your arm? WWJD. Army. What would Jesus do? And, and I think that 
as, as cool as the bangle was and, you know, all kids, you know, bought them at the time, it's such a truth of like, well, if we want to become more like Jesus, well, what would Jesus do? Because if my life is not living out those specific habits or those specific truths, it will, we'll never get there. We'll never get there. And ultimately, yes, grace allows us and affords us the empowerment to be able to walk a life that is empowered through the forgiveness of sins for us to step into that place. But it really is for us to implement some of these, these real truth dynamics of like sitting and going, if Jesus prayed for the sick, yeah. am I praying for the sick? Mm. If Jesus washed his disciples' feet, if he took on the nature of a servant, am I doing that? I want to be like Jesus. You know, I, so. I, want to, I want to touch on something that you said there because I think a lot of people perhaps listening to this who look at their own lives and they like, you know what, well, I'm not like Jesus. Yeah. And so that shame, that guilt can actually wear us down. Yeah. And what you said there was so key that we are empowered by the forgiveness of sins. And, and one of the, the topics that um, Rick Warren touches on is he actually looks at God's purpose in our life is far greater than our problems, our pain, or even our sin. And, and what I do love about this, he reminds us that when Matthew starts articulating Jesus' genealogy in the first book of the New Testament, this is now the starting point of the new covenant being preached, he specifically references four ladies in Jesus' family tree. Uh, the first lady is... Tamar, and Tamar actually seduces her father-in-law Judah to make her pregnant, and Jesus comes from that line. Crazy. The, the second lady is Rahab, who was the prostitute, um, a pagan prostitute who is grafted into Jesus' line. Mm. The, the third lady was Ruth. Um, she wasn't even Jewish, and when she got married, it was breaking Jewish law. Um, at that time, and yet she was grafted into Jesus' line. And then Bathsheba, who committed adultery with David that resulted in her husband being murdered, like Matthew specifically references these ladies because the Jewish people were, were looking at themselves and saying, no, we descendants of Abraham, we so great. And Matthew points out, actually, like if you look in your family tree, you're not all that great. Yeah. And, and I love that is that there's hope. So yes, we need to live like Jesus and we need to understand what Jesus would do. But at the same time, it's not just in our strength. There is this empowering of the Holy Spirit as we relinquish our sins and we ask God for help. And he's saying, no matter what your problem, no matter what your pain, no matter what your past, mm. my purposes are bigger, but it comes back to that thing of you need to choose it. Yeah, choice. It's a big thing. You know, I think there's lots to choose from. And we have to choose the right thing. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's like raising kids often. You know, it's like, okay, you need to choose the right thing. A lot to choose from, but choose the right thing. Well, I think it's a powerful, powerful week. And if I look at it again and just uh, be reminded again that actually if Christ is the one, the ultimate, mm. how do we become like Christ? And how do we order our lives to become like Christ? And what choices are we making to put into the daily expressions of our lives, to see something of the molding and shaping take place, the maturity of God mm. in us and through us. And so I, I think it's just an awesome, awesome one. I think, I think if, if I could, there, there, there was one thing which I found particularly helpful. And um, I, I remember when I was new in the church context, um, one of the pastors took me out for a coffee and um, I'll never forget, it was early one day before me going to work and he sat me across from the table, Justin Donlin, and he put a coffee in front of me and he said, uh, Trevor, he said, uh, if the devil were going to try to tempt you, what three areas would he attack? <laughs> yes, and I remember, like, this is one of our first experiences. Uh, like, I'm like, what is this guy talking about? But, but it was so good. And I'll never forget that question. Yeah. And, and Rick Warren mentions that. He, he says, Part of us being developed in the likeness of Jesus is us overcoming temptation. Mm. And when we realize how predictable the devil is, it gives us the edge. Sure. So there are going to be areas in our lives that he will continually look to attack. And his counsel was don't become intimidated. Mm. 
like we, we're never going to outgrow temptation, but through the Holy Spirit, we can resist it. Meaning you, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from making a nest in your head. Yeah. And, and he gives just some practical advice around understand the patterns of temptation Ask God's help for it and then resist the devil. And as you do that, like you said, you are going to mature over time. That's powerful. So that was, I think that's a wrap for this week. Just a wonderful reminder again. Um, I think it is, it's good for us to be putting these billboards up and saying, how are you going with this? Where are you going? What direction are you going? And we're going to go into uh, next, the next chapter next week. And the topic is, you were shaped for serving God. Now, you might get lost a bit there hearing the word serving, but I just want to encourage you, like there's incredible things that we can learn from Christ, but actually the power of serving. And so we're going to touch on that in our next chapter uh, next week. Uh, so why don't you keep tuning in uh, with us. So we'll see you there.